Welcome everyone to the University of New Mexico Department of Anthropology's speaker colloquia series. Um, I Today, uh, our, our speaker is Dimitri Brown. Um, and before I present him, I um, would like to make a quick note uh, regarding the land acknowledgement for the University of New Mexico. The Association of Indigenous Anthropologists has requested that the American Anthropological Association officially pause mm -hmm. land acknowledgements so that a task force that they have established can conduct further research and develop a set of recommendations to improve the practice. So in solidarity with this request and with the responses and opinions of indigenous people that it aims to address, I will not read UNM's statement of land acknowledgement today. I'm providing instead in the chat a link to an article explaining this requested hiatus uh, as well as links to the websites of some local activist organizations here in New Mexico, such as the Red Nation and Pueblo Action Alliance, where you can learn more about ongoing efforts to repatriate land and resources. There are the links. Um, and we also would like to thank the Alfonso Ortiz Center for Intercultural Studies and the Latin American and Iberian Institute for their support of the speaker series. So Dimitri Brown is a PhD candidate in the history department at the University of California, Davis, with a designated emphasis in Native American studies. He's finishing his dissertation titled Tewa Pueblo at the dawn of atomic modernity. His work is currently supported by the Katrin H. Laman Resident Fellowship at the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe and by a Mellon ACLS Dissertation Completion Fellowship. The title of the talk we're going to hear today is The Meaning of Science on the Pajarito Web Plateau, Connecting Anthropology, Atomic Physics, and Tewa Philosophy Through the Metaphor of the House. And before I turn over to our speaker, let me make a few procedural reminders. Um, first, please mute your video and audio during the talk in order to preserve bandwidth. And second, feel free to type any questions you have during the talk into the chat. And we'll address these during the Q&A session afterwards, during which time you may unmute your video and audio to ask your question directly to the speaker. Um, and you, you're also free, of course, to, to just ask the question without typing, typing it into the chat. And um, the, the conversation after the talk is often um, a really a fascinating part of the colloquium series, so I encourage you to stick around and participate in that. Um, finally, today's talk is being recorded and will be posted on the Anthropology Department's YouTube page. And now uh, I'll turn over uh, to Dimitri Brown. And thank you so much for um, participating in our colloquium series and sharing your research with us. Of course. Uh, thank you, Josh, for the introduction. Um, I was interested to hear about the hiatus on the land acknowledgement um, section. I've been really curious following the dialogue on those issues. Uh, thank you also for inviting me to speak today on my work, and thank you for everybody who's here listening on this beautiful Friday afternoon. Um, it's an honor to join you here at UNM, uh, even via Zoom, and take part in this event for a couple reasons. For one, I've done a ton of research uh, there at UNM, especially at the Center for Southwest Research in the Zimmerman Library and at the Maxwell uh, Museum Archives. And it feels good to um, come here and share at least a little of that archival work. Some of it is definitely included in this talk. Um, on another level, I have uh, several family ties to UNM, and it feels good to recognize those connections. My grandmother earned her doctorate at UNM in American Studies, and I'm pretty sure both of my parents received degrees at UNM as well. My grandmother's name is Rena Swensel, and she's a fairly well-known Tewa scholar from Santa Clara Pueblo. And as you'll see kind of throughout this talk, especially at the end, uh, she's been a huge part of my work and stories of her childhood in Santa Clara in the 1940s essential components of my dissertation. Um, when I was invited kindly to participate in this anthropology colloquium, I learned that several graduate students here are interested in nuclear power in the region and that many others in the department are interested in environmental conflict involving Native communities more broadly. Um, 
hopefully I'll be able to touch on at least a few of those uh, things that some of you are interested in, but I'm gonna take a sort of indirect approach to those topics. I'm speaking today on a particular aspect of my work that corresponds approximately with more or less um, one chapter of the dissertation. And it's the one that includes the fullest discussion on anthropology. So that seemed appropriate given this is the anthropology colloquium series. Uh, but before I dive into anything, I wanna take a minute to describe my dissertation um, overall so that you have a sense of where this work is coming from, the larger context. And then I'll move on to the more specific subject I want to discuss today, which is the idea of science or the meaning of science on the Pajarito Plateau, what science has meant there from a variety of epistemological perspectives. So my dissertation is titled Tewa Pueblos at the Dawn of Atomic Modernity. And it's about the relationship between the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos and the Tewa Pueblos which include the indigenous nations of um, indigenous nations and communities of Santa Clara, San Odefonso, Okeowinge, Chisuki, Nambe, and Pawaki. Many of you are probably familiar with these groups, but I've learned it's best to give at least some sort of short explanation to make sure everyone is on the same page. Um, during the Manhattan Project, which was the secret scientific effort to develop atomic weapons, before the Nazis during World War II, many Tewa villagers rode buses up to the site at Los Alamos for work. One image that really sticks in my mind is um, of women waiting in the Pueblo village, in their Pueblo village at dawn for the bus to come and ride, riding up that winding Mesa Road to Los Alamos, which is what you see in this slide. Um, it's a beautiful road and probably some of you have driven up it before. My great grandfather, Michael Naranjo, was among the men who worked there. He was a carpenter. Originally, he had hoped to serve in the military, but the registration office in Española knew that he had too many children to take care of, and so they denied his application. I think it's fair to say that the Manhattan Project was a pivotal moment in 20th century world history as it ushered in what we call the Atomic Age. I also think it's fair to say that if and when most people or scholars consider the relationship between the Manhattan Project and the Table Pueblos, they think of nuclear colonialism and environmental degradation. Sometimes the relationship appears as a prelude to the effects of uranium mining in Navajo and Western Pueblo contexts. Now, those are absolutely important stories, but the one I'm trying to tell here is different. Um, I'm really trying to position the Manhattan Project within Tewa context to understand what it means within Tewa history uh, by emphasizing Tewa perspectives. I use a variety of lenses, including Tewa storytelling, pottery, adobe architecture, politics, and cosmology to try to make sense of the Manhattan Project in the Tewa world. Um, I'd be happy to talk about the dissertation more broadly later if anyone has questions about it. But for now, I'll just leave with the idea that the Manhattan Project was part of larger patterns of incursion and accommodation in the table world. With that, uh, let me try to map out what today's talk is going to look like. So in a general sense, I wanna ask, what is the meaning of science on the Pajarito Plateau? The Pajarito Plateau is the Mesa region between the table pueblos of the Rio Grande Valley and the Jemez mountain range, the sacred mountains that mark the western edge of the Tewa world. Los Alamos is located on the plateau, as are many ancestral Pueblo ruins. The question, what is the meaning of science on the Pajarito Plateau, is a question that helps us understand some aspects of the Manhattan Project in the Tewa world, and it also raises an important scientific precedent on the plateau which is that of archaeology and anthropology. The talk is titled The Meaning of Science on the Pajarito Plateau, Connecting Anthropology, Atomic Physics, and Teo Philosophy through the Metaphor of the House, because I think at the heart of the question, which is one of meaning, we find language or languages and the need to translate through common metaphors. Much of the discussion here is based on the goal of the dialogue between anthropology, atomic physics, and theophilosophy, 
And to accomplish this, we need to find points of tangent between disparate ways of knowing and viewing the world. I think a quote from Vine Deloria Jr., who is a well-known Native American um, scholar, is useful in visualizing this idea. And I'm about to see if my slide show works. Okay. Um, uh, so Vine Deloria Jr. said, because tribal society is integrated toward a center, a non-Indian society is oriented toward linear development. The process might be compared to describing a circle surrounded with tangent lines. The points at which the lines touch the circumference of the circle are the issues and ideas that can be shared by Indians and other groups. There are a great many points at which tangents occur, and they may be considered as windows through which Indians and non-Indians can glimpse each other. I'm very interested in these glimpses and what they might tell us about the Manhattan Project, about science, about public survival, and about the way we tell history. Just to build on this idea of tangents for a second, though Vine Deloria was speaking generally about native and non-native social patterns, I think his comment maps on very well to specific Pueblo shapes and dynamics. I know many of you are familiar with the Pueblos, and if you spent much time in this area uh, in the Southwest, you know how ubiquitous the sort of inward directed spiral is on pottery, on petroglyphs, um, in dance movements, all these very significant symbols of Pueblo life. In many ways, I think that that spiral stands in contrast with common ideas of progress and development in Western conceptions of time and history. As a historian, personally, uh, something that comes to mind immediately is Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier thesis, which claimed that American identity had developed in progressive stages as a result of conquering the American wilderness and gradually building towards civilization. Many, including two scientists I'm going to reference in the talk today, Edgar Hewitt and Robert Oppenheimer, conceived of science in a similar way that it is progressively expanding into the frontiers of the unknown. These abstractions of Western progress and Tewa circular integrity show us something very interesting upon encounter. Viewed together, these two models, the inward spiral and linear progress conjure something like the collision of a subatomic particle fired at an atom, something shatter, some do nothing, some fracture away, some are pulled inward, and some bond with others all in an uncertain manner, depending on an array of factors. Throughout the dissertation, I tried to show how in some cases, the circular pool of Tewa society drew in aspects of Western society, and in other cases, Western society displaced Tewa components from their traditional orbits. I'm really interested in how those dynamics of encounter may have refracted the meaning of science on the Parito Plateau. And with that, I'll turn to the main substance of the talk. There is no word for science in Tewa. And when we think about it, science is actually somewhat difficult to define using Western cultural parameters as well. We know that it involves observation, experimentation, analysis, and hypothesis, and it, science, strives to understand the laws of the universe through a systemized form of knowledge production. But conceptions of what constitutes science have changed over time. The overall point here is that it's difficult to talk too directly about the meaning of science on the Pajarito Plateau, given the array of assumptions about science and the difficulties involved in translating between Western and indigenous epistemologies. Still, I think it's important to try to develop a dialogue or to try to find a window between atomic physics, anthropology, and Tewa philosophy if we're going to try to understand the meaning of science on the Pajarito Plateau. So with that goal in mind, I want to introduce Robert Oppenheimer, the head physicist and director of the Manhattan Project, who's pictured on the left, and his idea of the house called science. He used this idea or metaphor of a house in a radio broadcast lecture in the early 1950s. 
This concept of the house called science opens what I think is a productive way to consider the meaning of science on the Pajarito Plateau. And I have two reasons for thinking this. For one, Oppenheimer's metaphorical use of the house connects with the scientific precedent of anthropology and archeology span on the Pajarito Plateau. In the late 19th and early 20th century, leading anthropologists believed that the house held the key to understanding kinship structures of primitive man. By extension, kinship structures opened the door to understanding demography and population spread on the American continent. Scientific understandings of humanity's past drove anthropological interests in the ancestral pueblo ruins of houses on the Pajarito Plateau. Second, Oppenheimer's metaphor of the house called science presents a bridge or a point of tangent uh, with Tewa ways of knowing. In that Tewa houses and architecture embodied many key aspects of what it meant to think and to know as a Tewa person. As I've mentioned, uh, my grandmother is at the heart of my research. She was an architect and philosopher from Santa Clara Pueblo. And this uh, sort of last part of the discussion will rely strongly on her memories and her work. I think it will be easiest to spend some time with each of these distinct ideas, the anthropologist's ruin, the physicist's house called science, and my grandmother's ideas on architecture, and then at the end, I'll start discussing how I'm trying to weave them together or how I think they come together and work together. Before Oppenheimer and the Manhattan Project, Edgar Lee Hewitt, who is on the right, was the face of science on the Pajarito Plateau. Hewitt had first come to the Southwest in the late 19th century and he was fascinated by the land and the people of New Mexico. He took up the writings of Adolf Bandelier, who's in the center, who I would imagine is a somewhat familiar name to you all. Uh, this is the Bandelier for whom Bandelier National Monument is named. And so following Bandelier's lead, Hewitt entrenched himself in the study of the ancient ruins that dotted the Southwestern landscape. He found the Tewa Pueblos to be particularly accommodating, and so he focused on a string of ruins to the west of Santa Clara and San Ildefonso. Like many anthropologists and archaeologists and uh, historians, most specialists really, Hewitt was territorial and ensured that the Pari de Plateau was his domain. The main point here is that Hewitt was part of a scientific lineage of men that transformed the ruins of houses on the Pajarito Plateau into scientific data to be compiled, compared, and analyzed. Objects found within the excavated rooms were to be extracted from the sites and moved to museums, there to be studied and preserved for future generations of anthropologists, not Tewa people. Um, we can trace the scientific lineage back to Lewis Henry Morgan, who's on the left, another famous name in the history of anthropology, who wrote, quote, the history of the human race is one in source, one in experience, and one in progress. Morgan, along with Bandelier and Hewitt, believed that archeological excavations and ethnological inquiries into primitive cultures clarified the historical development and deep past of all humanity. For these men, and later many women, the Southwest generally and the Pajarito Plateau specifically was an ideal laboratory for anthropology. Just to foreshadow things or connect it with um, my larger work, it's very interesting that Manhattan Project leaders and physicists, especially Robert Oppenheimer, also found the Pajarito Plateau an ideal setting for a laboratory. Um, but what did that transition mean? Uh, that, sorry, that translation of place mean for Tewa people. On one level, a more official political level, the Tewa Pueblo steadily grew more comfortable working with the anthropologists in ways that were beneficial or at least less destructive to them. Um, Bandelier, for example, had a reputation for probing into the religious life of the Pueblos. This is a side point, but there's a really interesting mixture um, in Bandelier's writings of being disparaging and dismissive of Pueblo religion, basically equating it to childish secrecy. 
Uh, and at the same time, he just wants to know those secrets so badly. And this ends up leading to his advocating against assimilation because he wants the Pueblos to remain Pueblo, at least in the way that he conceived what that meant, um, so that they could be studied by anthropologists in a purer form. Uh, by, by the time it was the lead, the lead uh, scientist on the Pajarito Plateau, the Pueblos had learned to interact with him directly through religious and other leaders, that is people who understood and could better guard the more deeply sacred aspects of Pueblo life. In this way, the Pueblos could monitor to a better degree where he went and what he learned. On another level, these types of tribal government to anthropologist relationships did not always function seamlessly. The scientists there were, um, um, of course, trying to uncover buried secrets of the past, communal houses, kivas, storage rooms, artifacts, and skeletons that did not necessarily want to be disturbed. And on a third level that intertwines with both of these, Pueblo men worked as wage laborers for the excavations, which in bringing dollars into the community is associated with the slew of socioeconomic um, issues the Pueblos faced in the early 20th century, including a decreased reliance on farming, shifts in value and kinship-based sharing systems, and we can include alcoholism here too, Maria Martinez, the famous potter uh, from San Ildefonso, for example, spoke about her husband took a job excavating on the Pajarito Plateau and the wages that he earned there kind of symbolized his lifelong battle with alcoholism, the beginning of it. Um, in order to bring out some of the more subtle implications of these archeological excavations in the table world, I wanna share two stories from an oral interview in the 1960s given by a Santa Clara Pueblo elder. In one of the Santa Clara elders' stories, a Santa Clara man named Basilio worked for a woman named Lucy Wilson, whom Hewitt had taken under his wing. Hewitt, Edgar Hewitt helped her set up a summer archeology span project along with the right permits and also contacts in the Pueblos. As he worked, Basilio would sometimes find small artifacts, pieces of carved bone and that sort of thing that he would simply put in his pocket. On another occasion though, Basilio found a bowl in one of the caves and recognized it immediately as being of sacred ceremonial importance. He didn't think that the bowl should be removed from the cave. So he tried to put it back and bury it before Lucy Wilson noticed. She saw what he was doing and the two had an argument. Basilio claimed that the bowl was sacred and that they should not remove it from the cave. Lucy Wilson, of course, needed it for scientific reasons. Basilio refused and Lucy Wilson fired him. I think this example uh, helps underscore the idea of failures of translation when we're thinking about the meaning of science on the Pajarito Plateau. In the second story from this 1960s interview, the elders shared an event witnessed by a Santa Clara man named Gutierrez who worked on the Puyé excavations under Hewitt. One day when Gutierrez was working, he noticed the digging crew taking burials out from the cliff dwellings. And at that moment, something strange started happening. People or some mysterious entity from the top of the mesa, quote, started throwing rocks at them. In case you haven't been to Puyé, um, this is regarded as an ancestral Pueblo of Santa Clara. And the way it's structured is that there's a village on top of the mesa, a village site on top of the mesa, and uh, cliff dwellings kind of below that mesa. So as the men worked in the cliff dwellings below, something above um, from the village site above was throwing rocks at them. And every time the workers went up to see who was throwing rocks, quote, they just couldn't find anybody there. The next day, the crew removed more burials. No rocks came, but in the afternoon, quote, it started getting windy and the clouds started coming out and they had a big hailstorm. The excavation crew hid inside the caves, but somehow hail blew inside the caves too. The crew decided to head down to the canyon where they might be safer. As soon as they started for the canyon, the hail stopped. 
Summer hailstorms in New Mexico aren't unheard of, as many of you probably know. And the crew believed that the had passed, and so they returned to work. But once they were back at the burial sites, quote, the same thing happened. There was another hailstorm. The crew decided to quit for the day, agreeing the weather would improve the next day and to try again. But on the third day, another hailstorm prevented work. The canyon, the tail workers gathered and agreed that if on the fourth day, the same thing occurred, quote, they were just going to stop completely, forget about the excavation. The fourth day brought yet another hailstorm. And the tail workers, quote, decided that they were just going to leave everything and go home. Upon making that decision, quitting the excavations and returning home, the tail workers heard shouting from the top of the mesa, quote, the Puye people were shouting and singing and everything. The message to Gutierrez and to the other tail workers was perfectly clear, though less so to the archeologists. Curiously, hailstorms do not appear in Hewitt's published recollections, nor in what I've uh, been able to find in the archives yet. But Hewitt does seem to have had a certain sensitivity to Tewa spirits and to the gulf between scientific excavations and Pueblo mysteries. For example, he described the first time that he visited the Pajarito Plateau, quote, when the stillness and the mystery of it were undisturbed. It took me, this is still Hewitt's quote, it took me quite a while to make up my mind to disturb the soil that I felt was sacred longer still to spoil the scene with scientific papers. It's possible that Hewitt did recognize the hailstorms as a sign of the Puye people's displeasure, but whether he did or not, clearly science had called on him to disturb and spoil the mysterious stillness he had been so fortunate to see. I want to transition to Oppenheimer's perspective here, uh, but there doesn't need to be a complete break between Hewitt and archaeology uh, and Oppenheimer and physics. And uh, in commenting about my transition, I'm making this less fluid than it could be. Uh, but I want to share first one quote from a Pueblo leader about Western and Pueblo epistemological differences, and then a quote from Oppenheimer that helps highlight the connection between anthropology and physics from a Pueblo perspective. So in 1943, in a congressional hearing about potential dam sites on Pueblo lands, a Pueblo leader explained, quote, the white man is looking for something which he, the white man, never lost. He continued, the white man wants to know where the stars are and where the moon is and what everything is. We do not like to do those things. What we want to do is continue leading our life the right way. Let's for a second hold this in one hand. I think about something Robert Oppenheimer said, quote, it is a profound and necessary truth that the deep things in science are not found because they are useful. They are found because it was possible to find them. The idea of never having lost anything is actually kind of similar in both quotes, but Oppenheimer, like Hewitt, of course, was driven to keep looking. In this next section on Oppenheimer, I want to warn you that there are a series of lengthy quotations. Um, and if you've ever encountered Oppenheimer's writing for any reason, um, you'll have an idea why. Not only is he incredibly quotable, but he, um, he has this way of expressing ideas uh, through kind of rich description and an accumulation of observation and analogy. So near the end of 1953, Oppenheimer shared his view on science and humanity for the prestigious BBC Reef Lecture series. His voice had a warm, steady, and precise tone. Um, and you can actually find this speech and others online pretty easily. And if you have any interest at all, I'd highly recommend listening to them, um, listening to him talk, because he's just such an enormous figure in 20th century history and the history of the atomic age. And yet he's got this voice that sounds a lot like Mr. Rogers, um, if Mr. Rogers was a chain smoking physicist. In fact, that kind of weird discrepancy between his uh, tone and his place in history was noticed at the time. People were expecting something dramatic, uh, something of world historical importance about atomic weapons or things like that. 
Um, Oppenheimer was famous for being a founding father of the atomic age, if not the father of the atomic age. But Oppenheimer instead, in these 1953 lectures, gave his audience a philosophy of science. In the final segment of Oppenheimer's lecture, he described atomic theory as a, quote, relatively quiet room in the, quote, house called science. And then he described the house. It is a vast house indeed. It does not appear to have been built on any plan, but to have grown as a great city grows. There is no central chamber, no one corridor from which all others vouch. It is a house so vast that none of us know it. And even the most fortunate have seen most rooms only from the outside or by fleeting passage, as in a king's palace open to visitors. It is a house so vast that there is not and need not be complete concurrence on where its chambers stop and those of the neighboring mansions begin. According to Oppenheimer and to many other Manhattan Project physicists, science was expansive and unpredictable. It was massive and built on foundations of previous knowledge. It was open to all, but home to very few. Oppenheimer clearly adored this house and deeply admired the men who had constructed his particular room of atomic theory. At a few moments during the lecture, Oppenheimer considered other branches of science, other hallways and rooms in the house, in a way that opens the door for us to think about anthropology and table ways of knowing. Um, Oppenheimer explained that, quote, the discoveries of science, the new rooms in this great house, have changed the way men think outside its walls. We have some glimmering now of the depth and time and the vastness and space of the physical world we live in. We have understood something of the inner harmony and beauty of strange primitive cultures. And through this, uh, see qualities of our own life in an altered perspective and recognize its accidents as well as its inherent necessities. This passage above about um, the discoveries of anthropology raises several interesting possibilities. Did Oppenheimer consider the inner harmony and beauty of Tewa life? For one, after all, he had worked for several years on a mesa well within the Tewa world. And did perhaps the altered perspective gained by new understandings of primitive cultures provoke Oppenheimer to question his conception of science itself? To use his words, was science an accident or an inherent necessity of society? In another passage, Oppenheimer wondered more explicitly about the different epistemological foundations of a primitive village. Oppenheimer explained, quote, knowledge rests on knowledge. What is new is meaningful because it departs slightly from what was known before. This is a world of frontiers. Perhaps this sense was not so sharp in the village of slow change and isolation and fixed culture, which evokes our nostalgia, even if not our full comprehension. Perhaps in the village, men were not so lonely. Perhaps they found in each other a fixed community, a fixed and only slowly growing store of knowledge, a single world. Even that we may doubt, for there seemed to be always in the culture of such times and places, vast domains of mystery, if not unknowable, then imperfectly known, endless, and open. Oppenheimer was unsure on this point, but he pressed no further. He didn't wonder how the people of the primitive village might have addressed those vast domains of mystery, or how a Tewa village might have engaged those vast domains of mystery. He assumed that in varying degrees, they would approach the frontiers of the unknown much like he would to find the things that were possible to find. But we might recall what the public leader said at the dam hearing. Quote, the white man is searching for something which he never lost. He wants to know where the stars are and where the moon is and what everything is. We do not like to do those things. The final quotation I want to share from Oppenheimer brings us back to the idea of translation. This is from a later interview, but he picks up again on the potential of different forms of science in a way uh, that helps us think about the potential contrast between Western science and table ways of knowing. So he said, quote, I think that a quite different science, not contradictory to ours, but complementary, could perfectly well exist. 
may very well exist if there are any other forms of people some other place. They may be talking about other subjects and they may be concentrating on other questions because history, tradition, humanity, accident, all play a great part in what science is, but they play no part in whether it is true or not. That is its objectivity, communicability, its verifiability. Here, Oppenheimer underscored the importance of language that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. He believed that only through dialogue and translation could science approach notions of truth. I want to propose here that a science that is complementary to the one Oppenheimer expressed through the metaphor of the house exists in Hewa context. To explore that idea, I want to share just a few stories from my grandmother's youth. These are stories about her great grandmother, about language, and about houses. The first story um, is about my grandmother in the fifth grade in the late 1940s in Santa Clara. I'm going to use her first name, Rena, uh, just because that helps the story flow a little smoother. One day after school, a fifth grade teacher stopped Rena after class and asked if Rena would be willing to teach her Kewa. Rena agreed and stayed 30 minutes to help, um, to help her teacher learn the language. Shortly after, Rena's great grandmother, who was raising her at the time, asked why she was coming home from school later than the other children. Rena explained that her fifth grade teacher wanted to learn Tewa, and she never forgot the look on her great grandmother's face. Her great grandmother said, no, we don't do that. By the 1940s, Tewa people were familiar with anthropologists probing into their ways of life, their religion, and their language. And they knew that these probing sometimes led to intercommunal strife. And they also sometimes revealed aspects of the culture that were meant to be kept secret. But the lessons seemed to go even deeper than information control. Rena's great grandmother explained that the teacher would take the language and put it on a table, cut it up and analyze it. And that was not the way one treated a living being. The language itself was an alive thing. And as Rena's great grandmother explained, quote, when we go, that is when table people go, the language will go with us. And the idea was that that was an okay thing to happen because then the language would be able to take part in its own natural cycle of life and death. The next story I wanna share also deals with the cycle of life and death, uh, but it returns to the central metaphor of the house. So much of my grandmother's scholarship and philosophy came from childhood experiences in the Pueblo and something she often repeated in her writings and in her talks was about how she um, and her siblings and friends would taste houses as they wandered around the village. They would literally lick the mud plaster walls um, uh, of the adobe homes. The houses were built of organic materials and they were as much part of or members of the community as were the children themselves. Just as the houses were constructed of mud and earth and clay, our grandmother often also spoke of a linguistic connection between people and clay in the Tewa world. There was very little that separated the people from the ground from which they and the houses had emerged. The houses were also built in a way that mirrored the surrounding hills and mountains and brought energies inwards toward the central plazas, the hearts of each Tewa village. As a child, my grandmother noticed that each house, though constructed of the same materials, seemed to have a unique flavor, almost like a personality. She remembered noticing a crack forming in the wall of a particularly good tasting house and seeing that crack grow larger each day. She went home to her great grandmother and asked why nothing was being done about the house to fix it. Her great grandmother responded, that's none of your concern. It's been a good house. It has healed and been healed. And now it is time for it to return to the earth. And sure enough, soon after their conversation, the house crumbled down. From the pieces, the adobes, the mud, a new house was constructed in its place. The last piece in this section on Tewa perspective comes back to the idea of language. The Tewa word for house is Tehua. Hua means wall or cliffside, 
perhaps a connection to the ancestral cliff shelters like those found on the Pajarito Plateau. As my great uncle explained to me, the root syllable, de, defines the house. Some people believe that that root, de, derives from the word for tree, which is symbolically significant in origin stories for having allowed the people to climb out of the womb of the earth mother and onto her surface. De also means to teach or to model. A slight modification, de e, means kiva, which is the place where the religious life of the community is most explicitly expressed and modeled for younger generations. The same root can also mean to need. And what I take from these linguistic connections is the understanding that our basic needs for survival include both knowledge and shelter. Houses have basic needs too, like construction and care. In Tewa villages then, houses and humanity were mutually dependent and shaped each other. To take us back to the Pajarito Plateau, the ruins there, once houses, storage rooms, and kivas, have largely returned to the earth. But the pueblos still maintain connections to those ancestral homes. Again, Tewa language deepens our understanding of that connection. So after periods of drought and disuse, the structures became ruins. They eroded. Wode, to erode in Tewa, is related to the verb to share, distinguished by an accent on the first syllable. The language that my grandmother grew up speaking, but when she tried to teach her fifth grade teacher, held the seeds of thought that she later pursued as a graduate student and an architect, especially the idea that a house may crumble and fall apart, but in doing so it, in doing so it shares in a larger context. In conclusion, I want to recall the failures of translation involved in the story. Thinking back to the specific moment where Basilio could not convey the sacredness of a bull to Lucy Wilson, or the more general sense that the Pajarito Plateau was an ideal setting for an anthropological and atomic weapons laboratory at the same time that it was an ancestral grounds within the sacred boundaries of the Tewa world, but I want to suggest that these failures of translation, the incommensurability of ways of knowing on the Pajarito Plateau may actually help open up new understandings of science. Tewa houses, especially in their linguistic connection to the necessity of knowledge and in their crumbling natures, stood next to Oppenheimer's house called science. To clarify this idea, we can look back to a moment in physics during the 1920s when new experiments and theories shattered notions of classical physics and demanded new sets of terminologies. It was out of this conceptual explosion of quantum physics that the possibility for atomic weapons became clear. According to Niels Bohr, one of the main architects of Oppenheimer's room of atomic theory in the house called science, quantum physics involved, quote, recognizing that no experience is definable without a logical frame and that any apparent disharmony can be removed only by an appropriate widening of the conceptual framework. Bohr and Oppenheimer found harmony in the idea of complementarity. That is that mutually exclusive and contradictory descriptions of the physical world may each be also valid and necessary. Light, for example, behaves as wave and particle. In a similar sense, I think the metaphor of the house widens our conceptual framework of science on the Pajarito Plateau and encompasses the philosophical and epistemological dissonance that characterizes the relationship between Tewa villages and Western scientific efforts. To me, what is striking about the stories and linguistic connections of Tehua, House, and Bure, to a road, is the way houses in the bubble come across as living beings. They echoed and took part in their larger surroundings and cycles, and they were built in relation to one another in a way that contained the Pueblo and that focused energies inward. And this centered inwardness is probably the greatest difference that I see between the Pueblo house and Oppenheimer's house called science, which constantly expanded into the frontiers of the unknown. And it's the encounter between these two houses these two ways of knowing on the Pajarito Plateau that I'm really very interested in. Thinking back to Vine Gloria Jr.'s comment 
about points of tangent between cyclical and linear societies, we might ask, how does a circular and inwardly directed world or society like the Teo Pueblo world encounter one that is progressively expanding? What the metaphor of the house as a point of tangent shows us is that a dialogue between anthropology, atomic physics, and Taylor philosophy is possible. And that dialogue then opens, um, helps us begin to see not only how science on the Pajarito Plateau can be understood from Pueblo perspectives, but how science is refracted and accommodated in the dynamic inward cycles of Tewa life. Um, thank you all very much for listening. Uh, I'd be more than happy to try to address any questions uh, or comments you might have. And if anyone wants to follow up later via email, uh, I'd be happy for that too. I'm sure the, the colloquium organizers uh, would be able to share that with you all. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Dimitri, for, for sharing your research. And um, let's open up now to um, questions and answers. Um, anyone? who wants to go ahead now, feel free to just um, unmute and, and ask your question. Uh, hello, thanks so much for your talk. I um, I don't even have a very clear question, but I guess I have kind of a, I don't know, observation. And I don't know much about Tewa houses either, but it seems like when you contrast the house that science built and the Tewa house, or the house of science, it's not the house that science built, is that humans are building this house of science, right? And the Tewa house seems like it has its own agency to fall apart. Um, there's sort of a, a life cycle and it doesn't seem like the humans have as much role in it, at least the way you describe it. Is that, I don't know, is there anything to that kind of a contrast that might, um, I don't know, explain some of the translation problems? Sure, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for your comment slash question. I, I think that that's another, um, another difference that I'm trying to think through. Oppenheimer at another point describes when he's talking about his house, you know, he's very like, the men who built it, the architects of this house, he has like an, a heroic sense of them. Like, you know, these men are up on these high scaffolding and they're putting together this, this great um this great artifact there's like men are building this and it's a heroic act that they are doing that and that's not at all the way that pueblo houses are constructed or thought of um you know in santa clara at least as far as as far as i've heard from my grandmother and from relatives where it's it's a more um you know for one women are very much in charge of house building, house construction, house ownership. Um, and for two, these the sort of organic qualities of houses emerging from the landscape is, I think it's something that still comes across if you visit a, a Tewa village or something, these, these mud structures kind of seem to come out of the, out of the land itself in a way that contrasts with what open armor seems to be imagining, which is just this construction of science that men build that exists almost within a, a sort of void. Um, yeah, so all, all to say, I appreciate the comment. I think that that is uh, uh, definitely another co contrast that I would like to think through. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Um, do we have another question? Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you so much, Dimitri Brown. I, I thought that was an incredibly interesting talk. 
Um, my question is a little bit about your approach and whether or not the talk today used an approach that you use in the rest of the dissertation where, where you're sort of using, um, I guess, a concept or a metaphor as you described it to, um, to, to provoke a kind of dialogue. Uh, I thought it was in the way that you developed it, it was quite, um, it, it really did, uh, it worked very well. It had me thinking about a lot of different things. And I'm just wondering, is that, I'm not familiar with that method. It's sort of new. And um, I thought it was extremely interesting. Is that, is that a technique that you use in other parts of the dissertation? Yeah, uh, thank you, David, so much for that uh, comment. I really appreciate it. And it's, I, so I was just at the, the WH, the Western History Association Conference, and I was describing my dissertation and somebody made a very similar comment um, about the methodological approach. It's, so, it's something that I didn't like approach this project thinking would happen, but as I you know, developed research, I started finding these, these sort of keys that I felt like could bring in, could bring table philosophy, for example, and like atomic physics together in certain ways. So um, I, I tried to do this. I think that this chapter with the idea of the metaphor of the house is probably the most explicit in that sense, but there are other chapters that use pottery um, in a similar way. There is a chapter that uses the sun or the idea of the sun in a similar way. Um, it's, it's, it's like really productive because the sun of course has been associated with the atomic age, you know, from the Trinity site on like a second dawn. Um, and so, so then it becomes, I think, productive to ask, okay, so what is the sun meant in the table world? What does dawn mean in the table world? Um, and it becomes a way to bring these two, like these two kind of epistemologies together because it's they 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 don't normally talk to each other, and I've I've just found that metaphor or these things like houses or the sun or pottery, um, or even stories. Uh, um, have really helped develop the develop the dissertation chapter by chapter. Yeah. Well, again, I thought it was really interesting. I I guess it made me think a little bit partly because I'm thinking about it, of Hegel's idea of recognition. And, and Hegel has this idea that we can't really know who we are until we see ourselves in another. And um, I think part of it was the way that you sort of deliberately uh, move back and forth. Um, in your presentation, and I'm sure your grandmother Rena Swenzel's uh, observations were were particularly, you know, they they weren't accidental; they were evocative in a very. Um, but it's it was very interesting, and anyway, I thank you. I thought it was really good. Thanks. I, I really appreciate that. I I meant to also add something too in response, uh, but my. My dad uh, is, was an English professor. And I think a lot of the way that I'm thinking about metaphor, appreciating metaphor comes from growing up with him and with his appreciation of uh, you know, the language itself and what mm. we can learn from that. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Um, I, I had a, a question slash comment also. Um, I, I liked that story about the, the hailstorms and the, the rocks falling at Puye. Um, and it made me think of something. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of stories like that um, in different places where I work in the Andes. I, I remember a couple of occasions where you know, the engineers who are working on, um, you know, uh, irrigation projects and things like that told me about stopping work because the earth started to shake and they had dismissed, you know, people saying that they had to make offerings first and realized that 
they better come back and do it right. Um, and I thought that that was interesting because, um, you know, like the example that you give also, it kind of disrupts that, um, you know, that idea of this, you know, just very rigid um, epistemological divide between science and, you know, non-science, I suppose. And, and shows that in practice, you know, they're in the actual way of doing things, I guess sort of along the path of what's the one like um, Latour might argue, you know, that there's a lot more going on. Um, and, and so I wondered if, if there are other stories like that, if that's something that you um, have looked at more systematically or if that, that was just sort of a, um, you know, one story there. Um, it seems like it could help to kind of, um, develop a little bit further that that aspect of your argument if there were similar stories perhaps comparatively as well yeah i i absolutely agree with you that that it would be very helpful i i'm I, i'm trying to think and it's possible that there are at the moment my mind's kind of drawing a blank and as as far as that particular story goes and the other one about basilio and the and the jar um those have been sort of gems in terms of you know the archival research and uh you know like i wouldn't doubt that there are other stories like that um at the same time i nothing's coming to mind yet but i i appreciate that comment i think it i think it would be um i think it'd be i think it'd be great if i could come across more and could uh build up that idea further yeah thanks you, i mean you might look you know, comparatively at other, um, you know, other ethnographies, other histories for, you know, other examples of that. I think that there's- Absolutely. A, yeah, yeah, thank you. Do we have um, other questions? It would be, I'm just jumping in, it'd be fun to, put together a whole bunch of papers just on storms or something um, and see what you came up with, like, you know, like that. Um, certainly since I work in the Amazon, I've got those stories, you know, aviation projects that have to take into account wild storms and things like that. We've got time for more questions, so don't be shy. Speak up. Well, if we don't have further questions, um, we can stop here. And again, um, if you cannot find um, Dimitri Brown's email um, either on the ad for the talk or um, at the website of one of um, the institutions at which he's affiliated. Uh, feel free to write to um, to me or to to um, someone in the anthropology department, and we will um, certainly put you in touch. and And thank you for the, the offer for um, you know, for further communication. And thank you everyone for um, for your attendance today and uh, participation. And um, thank you, Dimitri that everyone has an excellent weekend. Of course, yeah, thank you all very much. All right, goodbye everyone, take care.